Ranger Melissa straddling a bicycle in the woods. Happy Glacier Science Day! I'm back for another episode of Glacier Science video series. I'm so excited today. I'm standing here in West Glacier and it's a beautiful day here. It's uh, There's all these really tall different uh, coniferous trees around me and it's about 70 degrees so it's a perfect day and I'm going to learn all about this wonderful air we have here in Glacier National Park. We are going to meet up with Ed Eberhardy, who's our physical scientist here in Glacier National Park and works on monitoring the air quality in glaciers. So I'm really excited to meet up with Ed today. Although I'm a little confused because he told me to meet him on my bike. So I'm gonna go down to the after bike path and I'm gonna find him and then we're gonna bike to the air quality monitoring site. All right, let's go. Melissa comes pedaling up to Ed Eberhardy, also on a bike. Hey, Melissa. Happy Glacier Science Day. Hi. Thanks for meeting us today. I'm so excited to learn all about air quality in Glacier National Park. I'm a little out of breath right now. I think I need to breathe some air. <laughs> but today we're going to um, head out with you and go to this monitoring site. But I was just curious, like it says that you're a physical scientist, but I'm not, I don't know if I'm totally sure what that means. What, what do you do? A physical scientist does many different things and wears many different hats. But in this park, primarily my main job is to measure the air quality throughout the park. I also do things that deal with water quality, lakes and streams, um, a little bit with dark skies. So many different aspects of what helps create the visitor experience. Great, I'm so excited to learn more. But why am I on a bike and what's that about? <laughs> Melissa points to the small trailer attached to Ed's back tire, packed with boxes and a large cooler. On the grass are several large machines. So we're on bikes because traveling by bicycle is a great way to have less emissions and help keep the air cleaner. And then all of this is all the gear we need to go to the air quality site and change out filters and so calibrate we're gonna use all that We're going to use all of that today. Awesome. Okay. I'm excited to learn more and I'm going to follow you. All right. Okay, let's go. Let's go. They arrive at the small brown building adjacent to a white tower. Wow, Ed. I can't believe it. I never knew that all of this was back here. I mean, I've been by this site a bunch, but there's so much equipment and different things that I didn't know about. Can you tell us a little bit about what's back here and what it's used for? Just give us a little overview. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot happens back here. We measure precipitation down to the hundredth of an inch. A round container with clear acrylic-like sides with a metal cylinder in the middle. Ed peers into it and writes down notes. He exchanges rainwater buckets atop another device. In that precipitation, we capture things out of the atmosphere and then we can measure them. So we have one device that measures all kinds of things from rainwater, including sodium, potassium, calcium, sulfate, ammonium, and a whole host of other things as a complete rainwater analysis. We also capture mercury out of the atmosphere via rainwater. Okay, so it's, that's all the stuff that's in the air, but you're getting the information because it's in the rain. Yep, a different way to measure would be with filters, and we measure a whole host of things that way too, including organics and inorganics and sulfates and nitrates and ammonium and whoa, all of those whoa, things again. wait a minute, you lost me here. Okay, hold on a second. So you just said organics and inorganics. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a little confused because I'm trying to figure out what organic thing is out like. Oh what? yes, pollen. Pollen is a huge oh, influencer yeah. of air quality yeah. as well as smoke. Smoke is a large component of air quality, specifically in, in, during fire season and in the fall, depending on where you live. Yeah, okay, so like the little particles in the air are organic. Image of a beach permeated with smoke renders the atmosphere opaque and thick. And the inorganic things would be like what you just said, like the mercury. And the potassium, potassium and the, the elemental okay. items. I yes. see, okay, yep. that makes sense. Okay, great. Yeah, and then on top of that, we also measure ozone which at ground level ozone has a very different influence than high atmosphere level ozone. Text, ozone injured plants. The leaves forest green color has taken on splotches of yellow. Um, it affects human health if it's in too high of levels oh, and wow. it can also affect plants and vegetation. I did not know that. That's okay. That's really good to know. Yeah, we do that. And then also here at the site, we measure all the normal things that everyone thinks about when they think of weather and air so wind speed relative humidity temperature all of the normal very cool this is so exciting you know next to the white tower the propeller on a device on top of a pole spins i would love to be able to dive into some of this equipment a little bit more and get some hands on can you take us to some of yeah. these yeah let's do it uh, okay let's go all right okay. melissa Where this is a mercury deposition sampler and we're going to change the sample bottle 
Okay, sounds good. You've got your gloves on. I got gloves. I'm gonna pretend it's raining with a little water. Ed pours a small amount of water into a bucket atop the mercury deposition sampler. The arms on tubes attached to the sampler move to the right. Oh man, okay, what happens next? And then Whoa, the, it's starting to move. Yep, the machine has a little eye to the sky, is yep. what I like to call it. Okay. Moves the lid. This side's the sample side, this side is not the so sample side. So now it thinks side. it's raining. Now it thinks it's raining. Okay. I'm gonna lower this. Ed reaches inside the mercury sampler. Melissa reaches inside and grabs the sample bottle. In high speed video motion, Melissa grabs the sample bottle, and they complete their preparations. And then I need you to reach in here and grab the sample bottle. Now we get to put the new sample bottle in. I'm ready. So, okay. I'm gonna open the bag. There's stuff in it. Ed holds up the plastic sack containing the bottle. There is. What's in it? There is a buffer solution of hydrochloric acid, which preserves the mercury between when it rains and when the lab analyzes it. Aha! Yeah. Very interesting. So pop the lid off there. In fast motion, they place a clear funnel atop the hydrochloric acid. sample that we took I saw that you put it in a cooler inside the red cooler which contains two plastic bags yep so the samples get shipped in a cooler which just protects them um, they're sent to a lab in Madison Wisconsin that analyzes them where's the mercury coming from like how does it get in the atmosphere so mercury primarily comes from industry it's mainly emissions from different types of manufacturing and factories um, and it's often brought into the park from faraway places because air masses move and carry things throughout the country. Two black metal fan gadgets spin atop a tall black pole. An image of a lake with sloping mountain ranges on either side. Shimmering sun rays break through some dark clouds in the sky, reflecting off the still water below. A lot of the air in the park, or all of it, comes from somewhere else. Thankfully, mercury here in the park hasn't really increased or decreased. It's been a pretty constant low level. Yes, which that's is, awesome. Yep, we're happy to see. So now we're done with the mercury, what are you gonna show us next? Are you gonna show us another piece of equipment? Yeah, should we check out the ozone? Yes, I want to, yes, I have lots of questions for you. Cool. Okay, okay, so we are at the ozone field. Ed and Melissa have returned to the small white tower. Kinda, it's actually a lot more goes on in here than just ozone. Okay. There are ozone analyzers, um, and they have to be inside a shed because they require a controlled environment to accurately measure how much ozone is in the air. Okay. Um, but then there's also another filter device on here, some other just general weather instruments, okay. um, and computers that help communicate all of that information real time to the folks that Get it. On four shelves inside the tower building is an ESC 8864 measurement device, several boxes, a laptop, and a thermoscientific analyzer. What cool. is happening here? So, we are about to lower this tower that is 10 meters tall, because at 10 meters is where we measure ozone. The o okay, you told us about measuring ozone. Yep. And you said something about the ozone that you think of in the top of the atmosphere is different than the ozone down low and I didn't want to interrupt but I'm a little confused. I understand how the ozone in the atmosphere works but I don't get this other thing you're talking about with ozone down low. Yep, so we like to refer to it as ground level ozone. An illustration denoting the three layers of ozone in the atmosphere. Text, pollution plus heat and sunlight equals ozone. Source, www.climatecentral.org. Um, it has an impact on human health, it impacts vegetation, all the things around us at this level. The primary producer of it would actually be volatile organic compounds. So that is a constituent of a lot of emissions from cars and vehicles. A snarl of congested traffic on a roadway and an adjacent parking lot demonstrates the cause of ozone. But those compounds grab energy from the sun and convert oxygen into ozone at the ground level. Oh! Yes. What? I never even knew that. And then that affects the everything on the ground, like everything, plants, animals, all of us. People. So that's why we monitor it. Yep. That's why we're promoting to not leave your car idling. If you have a chance to turn it off, yes. please do so. Turn the key. <laughs> that all affects both the air quality here in the park, but also the air east of us or wherever this air mass we're currently in is moving. An image of a woman standing at the edge of a cliff high above mountains leading to a snaking river far below. 
The sky is tinged with hues of orange, pink, and yellow. Okay, so, yep, so we measure at 10 meters up, and we're going to have Melissa lower the tower so we can change the filter. And I have no idea what I'm doing. Melissa grabs the rope on the tower. Yep, so I'm going to remove this. This safety here, oh don't worry, gosh. it's not actually dangerous. Oh, man. You're going to grab this, okay. like you're going fishing, yep. and hold on. I'm holding on. Oh. Ed pulls the attached tubes away, still connected to the rope. Well, let it, let it go, but... Okay. And we're going to bring the other end down. There we go. A bucket filter attached to the other end of the tubes reaches the ground on the far side. That's awesome. And on this end is the filter. Do I tie anything up? Nope, it's set. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, I see it. So this inlet goes through a filter and up the tube and down the tube and into our shed where the analyzers analyze the air for ozone. And you were telling me that you have to come every Tuesday. Why do you do yeah, that? Yeah, so it's actually Happy Science Tuesday. <laughs> uh, so nationwide, yeah, don't tell anybody. <laughs> nationwide Tuesday is when these site visits happen. So while I'm just doing my little part here, I'm actually part of all of the other hundreds of folks doing the same thing wow. on a Tuesday across the country. Wow, that is so cool. So everybody's doing it at the same time. And I would imagine because it's the air, and it goes everywhere. Having that knowledge is important because this, this air could be in Seattle tomorrow. That's right. Awesome. That is super cool, Ed. Well, thanks for showing us the, I cannot remember what the name of it was. The ozone. This is ozone, yep. Oh, okay. Well, I thought it was a phenomenometer or a <laughs> nanometer. <laughs> what is it called? What? That's a nephlometer. <laughs> a nanometer. Parts per billion, Science Tuesday. I'm so glad that not only are we monitoring all of this information here at Glacier, but like you said, um, collaborating with all these people across the nation and, and world mm -hmm. to see how air quality is changing across the earth. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, if folks wanna learn more about, you know, all the different measurements we do for air or even like water, or, you know, smoke, um, is there, how do they find out more? And also how can they contribute to not having bad air quality? Can you just tell right, us? Right, yeah, there's a couple things. So Glacier Specific, on our webpage, there are real-time measurements of ozone, for instance, is one of those. We also just got uh, new smoke monitoring devices that once fire season gets here, you'll be able to monitor wow. smoke impacts awesome. real-time here in the park, as well as a lot of the regular weather uh, measurements that you might think of temperature or wind. What you can do and what everyone can do is pay attention to what you might be putting out in the atmosphere, meaning leave your car off when you don't need to. Um, if you're burning things, do it responsibly. Don't make a ton of smoke if you don't have to. Uh, pay attention to the things that you use because all of the items that you use every day somehow had to be made and depending on how those are made might have emitted more emissions or not. Um, pay attention to your local areas, your cities, your, your count, or, um, landscapes, and where might pollution be coming from. Uh, all of those are good things to, to take note of and pay attention to and just help you think more about what are you doing that influences the air quality, which in turn influences all your neighbors and everyone around you. Yeah, and I guess eventually the whole globe. So thanks, Ed. We are learned a ton today. And I want to thank all of you for joining us for Glacier Science Day. Be sure to look out because we've got a lot more coming up this season for round two. And I also want to give a quick shout out to the person who makes a lot of this happen is our videographer, Renata Harrison, who's behind the camera. And you never see her. There she is. Renata Harrison juts out her hand in front of the lens and waves. And she is great to uh, get this all out to you and make these uh, for all of us to enjoy. So thanks, Renata. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Happy Glacier Science Day! Ed does a handstand on the grass.